All right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm doing this by faith. I had a message that I was teaching. I did it at the 9, nine o'clock encounter on Genesis chapter 2. It's called Lessons from Eden. And that's what I was going to do again. But when I heard Reverend Dion talking, I feel like I'm supposed to do something else. So I'm about to do this on faith. Amen. So if it don't work, it's Rem Dion's fault. Amen. Right. <laughs> I want you to turn to Psalm 126. No, really, in my heart, I love these people. I love this church. And um, so in Psalm 126, I'm sorry to the media team. Uh, Psalm 126. Uh, I do think that the message from the nine o'clock experience and encounter would be worth you purchasing. I don't. It, I'm not. I don't get anything from it. I'm not trying to trying to hustle you. I really think it's an important word. And if you didn't hear it, I think you know. I don't know if you make it available online or they have it downstairs. But if they have it, you should invest in it. Amen. You know, you you got you could play a lot of stuff in your car. It ain't nothing wrong with playing a message from God, amen, to have something like that. I got to watch these little corners here. Psalm 126, Lord, please speak to us. Uh, give us life, give us direction, give us hope. And we thank you in advance for helping us in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me get to it. Now, let me tell you a quick testimony. I have... Uh, up from June 26th to June 9th, July 9th, I was unable to speak. Um, I started having pain in my throat, severe pain in my throat back in September. Kept going to the doctor. They kept misdiagnosing. They said it was strep. So they gave me antibiotics and pain medicine, and it came back. It got back so bad, I drove myself to the emergency room. They scoped me. They did a CT scan and found out that my right vocal cord had hemorrhaged. And, and they were showing me where the hemorrhage damage was, so I wasn't able to talk for two weeks to why it healed. And they put me on a um, steroid. This is the first time I preach since then. I haven't been to my church since June, and I'm not going back to September because I need to recover. I need to recover. So, but I'm here because I love your pastor and his wife. I love these people, and I want to support. So I don't know how this is going to go because I'm not supposed to raise my voice. Because I don't want to blow nothing up. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying? So y'all pray that I can make this make sense. Amen. When I used to go to Bible college, no offense to any race here, we used to have a lot of white speakers come through. And the white guys wouldn't raise their voice when they preached. But they'd be killing us. And I was like, how can they kill us and they ain't yelling? Because black people, we, we, we cannot preach without yelling. You got to yell, lean back. Yeah, we do all that when we preach. And the white guys come through there and be killing us just like this. Just this whole time. And I asked the guy, I said, how's that? He says, he says, when you go home, I want you to cut you got a, he says, you got a gas stove or electric. I said, I got a gas. He said, when you go home, put the cut the burner on the front pilot and keep it low. And he says, and cut the burner on the back pilot and turn it way up. And so, and so I called him, I did it. He says, now touch each one. I said, I ain't doing that. He said, what I'm trying to tell you is both of them hot. Whether it's low fire or high fire, it's still hot. So I'm going to shoot for some low fire in here today. <laughs> Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. And the Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Verse 5. Those who sow in tears. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. One more time, verse 5. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. You may be seated. My subject today is 
this victory is going to hurt. <laughs> I feel like I'm on a new assignment to talk to somebody who's been crying. And you've been crying and you've been crying because you're hurting. And God says, you're going to sow in tears, but you're going to reap in joy. Yeah. Yeah. The goodness of God is so overwhelming and so consistent. God is so relentlessly good that oftentimes we take his goodness for granted. In fact, I believe that God has been so good to us that many of us are spiritually spoiled. When you really think about how great God has been over the course and the balance of your life, there is nobody looking at me or listening to me right now that can't agree with this statement, that your good days outweigh your bad days. Most of us struggle through seasons your whole life ain't been bad. But when it is bad, we act like it's bad. We get a flat tire. We out in the middle of the street just binding the devil. Look at Satan. We don't take care of the car. We don't rotate the tires. We don't check them when they ball. We don't thank God for the seven years that the tire was running with air in it. We, we rebuke the devil the day it gets flat. How about thanking God for the seven years the tire was rolling? How about thanking God for the 12 years the washing machine was working? How about thanking God that you ain't had to replace your iron or your dryer or your stove or your refrigerator for years instead of rebuking the devil every time something breaks down? Lord, I thank you for how long it was working. Your grace has been amazing. You have to look back over your life and begin to thank God for what he has done and how good he has been. Our God has been good to us. Our praise will never catch up to his goodness. Your praise will always be in the red. You know why your praise will always be in the red? Because the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 that our God shall supply all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, let me explain that. The word need is singular in Philippians chapter 4. In, in every translation, it is singular. And it really tripped me out because I was like, if God supplies all of our needs, shouldn't it be plural? Because we got more than one need. And what God showed me was the reason why it's not plural is because he's never late. <laughs> every time I had a need, he bet it, y'all. <laughs> He is always meeting our need. Every time we have a need, he meets it. Every time there's something that we're in need of, he meets that need. In this psalm, it is very interesting. You have to understand this psalm from a contextually based on when it was written and who's talking in the psalm. First of all, the person who wrote the psalm is talking in the first two, and two verses about something historical. The psalm really doesn't start in real time to verse 3. Look at verse 1 again. It says, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dream. That's a reflection on something God did in the past. In verse 2, it goes on to say, our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with song of joy, songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for us. That's talking about the past. It goes in verse 3 and says, the Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Now it's in a right now moment. So when you get to the middle of verse 3, the person is talking in real time. They're reflecting in verses 1 and 2. Look at what God did in the past when he set the captives free. It was like we were dreaming. When he did that, the nation started celebrating and saying the Lord has done great things for us. And we agree with the nation. He has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. But this psalm is a psalm of problems. It is a psalm of conflict. They are in a trial right now, and they're asking God to do in verse 4 something similar to what he had done in verse 1. They say in verse 4, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. In other words, Lord, turn our situation around. And when he says turn it like the streams in the Negev, the Negev is a desert. 
And what he's saying is, he's saying, God, turn it around quickly. Turn our desert into an oasis. Turn our desert into a stream. Turn our situation around quickly. And then God starts speaking, even though it doesn't say it's God. In verse 5, that's God speaking. And his response to them is this. They that sow in tears shall reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. So God's response is, I'm going to bring you out of this, but you're going to come out crying. This victory is going to hurt. Now, why is that so important? It's important because that's not how he brought them out the last time. He didn't really bring them out crying the last time. He brought them out quickly. And a lot of church people get confused because we think that if God is good, we should never experience bad. But a lot of the bad that we experience is a part of our equipping for our assignment. Because you can't help who you have never become. The incarnation of Jesus Christ theologically means that God became man. But practically it means that God became those who he would help. Now he knows what it means to be sick. Now he knows what it means to be tired. Now he knows what it means to be tempted. That's why the Bible says in, Ephesians, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, we have not a high priest who can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities because he knows what it's like to be human. If you've ever had to deal with cancer, if you've ever had to deal with a mental health illness, if you ever had to deal with pain and tragedy and loss and hurt and rejection, you had to deal with it partly because you're going to be assigned to help other people people who are going to be dealing with the same thing we don't get to pick our incarnation we just have to trust that God is going to work together for our good his assignment in our life this is a very interesting passage because again it starts off with a reflection and in the reflection they move into the present and then in the present God says you're going to come out but you're going to come out crying Watch this. They start this psalm off by saying when the Lord did it before for us when he brought our captivity, they're talking about being in bondage for years. And he says, when he brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dream. In other words, when God delivered them in the past, he delivered them so suddenly. When the Israelites came out of that bondage, it was so sudden they thought they were dreaming. And here's what God's telling me to tell somebody here. God's going to bring somebody out of something so fast you're going to think you're dreaming. I mean, it's going to shock you. It's going to be like... God, I can't believe you opened the door like that. It's not like you haven't been praying for it. It's not like you haven't been waiting for it. But he's going to do it so fast, you're going to think you were dreaming. I don't know who, who I'm talking to in here. But if you can receive that, you ought to rejoice right now that you serve a God that when he does it, it's going to be suddenly just like that. You've been praying for something to come around, something to turn. When he does it, it's going to be like that. You're going to wonder, is it real? Is it real? God, is this real? You're so good, I don't even believe this is real. Somebody who knows that you serve a God like that, give them a praise for that on faith. That you're good enough to shock me. I'm, you're going to shock me. You're going to do something I ain't even think you could do in my situation. You're going to save somebody in my family that I ain't even think would ever come to church. And you're going to do it in such a way when I look at their life, you're going to make me think I was dreaming, God. Somebody get it in your mind right now. God is going to make me think I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. And watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. There are two words I want you to pay attention to in verses 1 and 2. The first word in verse 1 is the word when. The first word, the, the second word I want you to see is the first word in verse 2, and that's our. When God, our mouths. Yeah, that's what I want to do. When the Lord, our mouths. When the Lord did this, our mouths were filled with joyful song. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. When the Lord brought our captivity, brought back Zion out of captivity, our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues were full of songs. When God, our mouths. When God, our tongues. When God, our mouths. When God, our tongues. Okay, what are you talking about, Keith? What I'm talking about is this verse is teaching us, this part of the text is teaching us manners. 
is teaching us a response to the goodness of God. When God does what he does, we ought to do something in response with our mouths and our tongues. When God did that, our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues were filled with songs of joy. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now because some of you just missed an opportunity to give God praise. Every now and then you got to keep track of when God did something for you because when God, your mouth when God, okay, when God woke you up this morning, let me tell you what God did. When God clothed you in your right mind, when God gave you the activity of your limbs, when God let all your children make it home safely, when God put a roof over your head, when God put clothes on your back, some of you stood in the closet this morning and had options. That's a God thing. When God gave you transportation, when God provided for your needs, when God put food on your table somebody open your mouth and respond when God made a way out of no way when God didn't let me get A's when I had unprotected sex and God y'all ain't gonna help me here, still brought me up is there anybody here that has a praise for a God who did his part Okay, wait, 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 wait. Maybe God hadn't done anything yet for you. Maybe you can't remember what he did. Maybe you're suffering with a little dementia. Maybe you're having a little Alzheimer's moment. I got you. I'm going to give you another chance to give him praise. How about this? Since you can't remember when he did something, why don't you praise him for what he's going? This one is in advance. <laughs> I'll praise you on credit. I'll, I'll praise you for what's coming. I ain't got to wait for a win. Now, right now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Listen, the songwriter said, God bless us so good, the heathens start talking about it. You know you blessed when people that don't go to church start saying, you blessed. The Bible says the nation starts saying, the Lord has been good to you. Is there anybody in here that wants a blessing from God that's so strong that people that don't even go to church say, God bless you. Wow. God, God, look at God working in over your life. And watch what they say in response. They say in response, yes, the Lord has been good to me. That blessed me right there because I struggle with this. When people say, man, God's been good to you, I try to be all humble. Oh, man, you know, I, you know I, if I had your hand, I'd throw mine in. I'm just trying, you the man, I'm just, I'm just, it's your world. You know how we try to do, we deflect all the glory from ourselves and really we're taking praise away from God. If somebody says God's been good to you, you know what you say? Yes, he has. Yes, he has. I'm not going to steal my, I'm not going to steal the glory from God. Yes, the Lord has been good. That's not arrogance. That's gratitude. That's not pride. That's celebration. I'm, listen, I can't take a shot on this. I got to have enough manner. This is what gets me. This is what gets me, especially with adults in church. I'm not even a hype man like that, but this is what blows me away. See, see to me, not praising God doesn't make logical sense to me. Because I, I watch people. I'm a people watcher. See, how can you be so cool when it comes to God, but if the Steelers... beat the Ravens? <laughs> you waving a yellow towel and yelling and high-fiving people you don't know and saying that's my squad and doing all that and making all that ruckus and, and wearing black and gold and representing a team that didn't wake you up this morning didn't die for you ain't never made a way out of no way for you but the God that woke the team up the God that can shut the whole universe down has done something for you and he can open up your mouth and then what gets me some of you have children who are ungrateful. How many of you know what it's like to have a child or a grandchild that's just ungrateful? 
You done took out a second mortgage to put them Negroes through school and they ain't never said thank you. You got on run over shoes, they got on Jordans, can't even play basketball. Got on Jordans, cause it's just, just, they just want some Jordans. They scrubs, can't even dribble. You got nice shoes on them, getting them stuff for Christmas. They never say thank you. You sacrifice your life. Your back is tied, your neck is tied, your feet are run over. Your, your, your whole body is breaking down just to make life easier for them, trying to give them what you never had. And they never turn around and say, thanks, mom, for all your sacrifices. Thanks, dad, for all your sacrifices. Isn't that a shame that somebody would be that ungrateful? And yet you come up in church and your heavenly father made it possible for you to do everything you did for your child and you act just like the kids. <laughs> Oh, I got to calm down. I got to calm down. Hey, calm down. Let me calm down. <laughs> I'm really. The psalm writer said, God, you had us dreaming. You had us thinking we was dreaming you was so good. And then you had the heathen. This was trip. This was trip, right? The nations that said God was good to them were their enemies. <laughs> Woo! He said he'll prepare a table before you, in the presence of your enemies. I know, I know it ain't right, but I like the food tastes better when I eat it in front of my haters. <laughs> I don't want you to miss the fact that in verse 4, they are in trouble. He says, we reflected on what he did in the past. That's how you feed your faith. One of the ways you feed your faith is look back on what he's done. It doesn't even have to be the same thing. I can be in a new situation, but you're the same God. Yesterday, today and forever and if you did that you can do this because you're still God so they're throwing their history with God up against their present circumstance in verse 4 and they're saying God do it again turn this situation again but before they say turn the situation in verse 4 look at the end of verse 3 the end of verse 3 messed me up because the end of verse 3 says yes he has been good to us and they says watch this and we are filled with joy now watch this. They say we are filled with joy, but watch this, y'all. There's somewhere between a victorious history and a troublesome current situation. The current situation has not been resolved. The current situation has not been remedied. Don't miss this. They are still in trouble. They are crying. And yet they say, but we are filled with joy. Okay, I don't, I don't. I don't really know how to preach that. I don't know how to preach that. How can you be in between? How can you be between a God who blessed you in the past and you're in trouble again and he ain't worked it out yet? But the Bible says, but they say, but we're filled with joy. Does anybody understand what it's like to be not there yet and it ain't over yet and it ain't fixed yet? But somehow on the inside, I can't even explain it because what's going on inside of me doesn't match what's going on outside of me. But the song says, he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice because he has made me glad. It's a joy that confuses the enemy. Like, how can you be rocking and trusting and worshiping? And see, see, some of y'all, see, some of y'all, you, when you come to church, see, I'm, I'm going to give you a little churchology. Some of y'all are under the impression that the people who, I know they're getting on your nerves because you, you came to spectate and they keep getting in your way when they stand up because you, you trying to see. You ain't, come to, you ain't come to worship. You came to observe. So every time they stand up, they're getting in your nerves. I know they're getting there. They should have warned you. They should have warned you. They should have warned you when they came in, like, I'm that I don't care person. I just want you to know, I don't care what you think about me. I don't care what you think about me. 
I done been through too much in life to be studying you and worrying about you. When I think about the goodness of Jesus, forget that. When I think about the dirtiness of me, when I think about everything he brought me out of, when I think about stuff he delivered me from, when I think about what could have been and what should have been and what would have been, I will get up in your face. But what you have to understand is everybody, see a lot of church people think people standing up because they got a raise. You think people keep popping up because they got a raise or they had something good happen to them or something great happen in their life. I'm going to tell you right now, the majority of the people that are popping up are popping up and stuff's popping off in their life. They got trouble on every side. They got drama in their life. But the Lord is my shepherd. And though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. This thing is real. It doesn't have to be good on the outside. I got joy before the situation turns. So they say, Lord, verse 4, I'm almost done. I, don't, I can't see the clock. Verse 4 says, Lord, do it one more time. But watch this, watch this, watch this. They don't even just say how to do it. They don't say what to do. They say, Lord, do, please do this for us. Turn it this time like the streams in the Negev. What, what that means is do it quick. Like you did it last time, because he did it quick last time. It was like, it was like they, you know, when I say quick, y'all understand, you've been waiting, you've been waiting, you've been waiting, you've been waiting, and then bam, it's like it's over. And you mean we ain't going to fight no more? You, 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 you understand what I'm saying? Like, you mean, it's, you, you mean we ain't going to be arguing like this no more? Like it's over? Like I have trained myself to deal with this drama. I've been working all my life trying to manage this, this over. You, it's a, that's how he did before. So he said, Lord, please turn it like that. And here's what God says. He says, you're going to sow in tears. This time it's going to hurt. Ooh, that's some, that's some tricky theology right there because we say, you can't do that, God. You're gonna, you see, see, what we have to understand is, is that God is not just concerned about delivering us. He's concerned about developing us. <laughs> see, see, you can't you can't develop people that you keep delivering quickly. Development comes through process. Okay, let me deal with process. I know there's a lot of people in here. You know, ladies all natural now. Everybody natural. Ain't nobody wearing the perm. But let me see. My mother and my mother-in-law, all the women in my life were cosmetologists. I don't even know how that's the case. My wife's mother, my mother, people around me all did hair. So my mother had cosmetology stuff at the house. I grew up around it. So she used to have perm around the house. So when I was a kid, because my stuff wasn't curly and nice, I would, you know, just experiment. I threw some band two up in my head one time. It's called some band two. Because I wanted that joint to lay down. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to lay down. Because it was like this. My head would be like this, like salute black man with bald fists. I'm going to lay it down. So I put, that, I put that perm on, right? And I put the perm on. It was white and it smelled bad. And I put it on and I left it on. I don't know. I, ain't, I remember what I, I said, I know you're supposed to leave it on. I don't know what you're supposed to leave it on for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. But I figured mine was so nappy, I doubled up on the time. It started burning. I started fanning my head. <laughs> And I was like this man, and I was in the bathroom fan. I said, but it's going to be laying down on this junk. What I learned was, what I learned was that fire was part of the process to straighten my hair out. That it wouldn't, that without that fire and them chemicals, that fire had to hit the, hit the coil and straighten it out. You understand what I'm saying? And so what I realized is that God is like process. God works like a perm. 
I know you don't like that heat. I know you don't like that fire. I know you don't like that burn, but he can't straighten you out. You, he can't straighten that mess out until he... So he said, this one gonna hurt. This one gonna hurt. You coming out, but you coming out crying. <laughs> But here's the good news. Here's the good news. You're going to sow in tears, but you're going to reap in joy. Oh, Lord, help me teach this. You're going to sow in tears, but you're going to reap in joy. Now, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. I promise I'm going to leave on this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. this. The law of the harvest is called the law of reciprocity. In the law of the harvest, when you sow a seed, you don't reap a seed when you sow a seed. In fact, when you sow a seed, you don't reap a seed. You reap whatever was in the seed. Can I give you some bot botany? When you sow an apple seed, in process, you get an apple tree with multiple apples. Because in the law of the harvest, you reap what you sow, you reap after you sow, and you always reap more than you sow. That's why I can't stand why people won't tithe. This is real simple to me. Let me tell you what the law of the harvest is. The law of the harvest says you reap what you sow. What goes around comes around. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, run over. Whatever you give is coming back to you. You, you. you reap what you sow. You reap after you sow, but you always reap more than you sow. He say, what does that have to do with this? Well, if I, sow, if I sow an apple seed and I get apples on a tree, if I sow a corn seed and I get corn, a stalk of corn with many ears and kernels on every ear, if that means that I reap more than I sowed and I reap after I sowed and I reap what I sowed, y'all with me? What does the verse say? It says you're going to sow in tears, but it says you're going to reap in joy. Okay, watch this, watch this, watch this. God is going to switch the harvest so that what's coming back is going to be more than what I put in. So you may have cried a little bit, but you're going to have a lot of joy on the other side. Okay, this, is, this ain't for everybody. Who, I only came to preach to people who've been crying. And God told me to tell you, keep on crying because your tears are a deposit on your seed. And your seed is coming back because he's a God of the harvest. And he's a God because he's the God of the harvest. He must give you more joy than the sorrow that you put with your tears. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Your joy is going to exceed your sorrow because he's a God of the harvest. He's an agricultural God. And he says if you put tears of seed in the ground, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I missed this. Look at the next verse. He says you're going to go out sowing seed. But when you return, <laughs> when you return, you're going to be carrying sheaves. Oh, man. I must be doing bad. Watch this, watch this, watch this. He says, watch this, watch this. This is, a, this is the agricultural God that we serve. He says, you know where you can put a seed? If I had a seed right here, I can get seed in my hand. I got to put sheaves in my arms. If I could hoop, I would say, what's coming back on the other side of your pain is far greater and far bigger than everything you're suffering. You think your God will let you cry for nothing? He's got your tears bottled up in heaven, and he is on your side, and he will make sure that every tear you cry is going into your seed, and you're going to have to carry out what you're carrying out of it with your arms. Here it is. Give me this. Um, I need Psalm 56. I'm going to close with this. Psalm 56. That's it. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to go to my little seat, and I'm going to leave y'all alone. Psalm 56, verse 8. Verse 8 and 9, Psalm 56. There it is. There it is. Yeah. Uh, is that still the same translation? Okay. Okay. Record my misery 
list my tears on your scroll? Are they not in your record? I want you to know something. God, go back to that verse. God keeps a record of our tears. Like God has a has a has a record, like tears on record. He doesn't. In fact, in fact, you don't have to say anything. God can interpret a tear. He knows what the tear meant. He knows the language of a tear. I did a study on tears one time. This, 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 is, this is a real story. If you have, when your eye releases a tear, if something gets in your eye, and your eye responds by releasing tears to wash it out, when they survey those tears under science, that, that tear is 98% H2O. It's all water. But when a tear comes out of the same eye that's pain-oriented, that's not a response to an irritant in the eye, when it's emotional, it's, it's, it's almost 70% chemical. In other words, the tears have toxicity and pain in them. God has trained us in such a way that we release pain out of our eyes. And he says, every time it drops, I got it. I know what it meant. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. He says, he says, then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. But this I will know, that God is for me. Amen. One thing God wants you to know when you're going through something, he wants you to know this, I'm for you. I'm for you. Because um, that's what the devil will make us think. He can't be. He can't be. Every storm in the Bible, I said I was done. That's a lie. Every, you know, when the preachers say done. <laughs> Satan, Peter, Simon, Peter, Simon, Peter, Luke 22, 31. Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat. Satan wants you. That's respect. That's spiritual respect that Satan wants you. That Satan views me as his enemy. That's spiritual res spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is supernatural respect. <laughs> we don't look at it like that. Watch what Jesus says. I would think, Jesus, you love Peter. You, Jesus said, but I ain't going to let him do it. I ain't going to let him lay one hand on you. I will not, I will bust him in the face. Here's what Jesus says. I'm in Luke 22, 31. I know I've been all over the place. He says, but I pray for you. Prayer? No, nah, Lord, it's fighting time. You know Peter, he will fight. You can pull a knife out. Watch this. He says, I pray for you, not even that Satan wouldn't attack you. You know what he said I prayed? I prayed that your faith wouldn't fail. Woo. You mean what's precious to you, God, is not my health, not my money, it's my faith? I want my back to stop hurting. I want the pain to go away. He says, I ain't even watching that. I'm, I got my eye on your faith. I got my faith. I got my eye on what's eternal because I got a plan for this. Watch this. When you are converted... When you come out of it, verse 34 says, I want you to go strengthen your brother. Y'all missed it again. You missed it again. See, I, I, see, Satan means it for evil. I got a good plan in mind. I got, it's going to hurt you. In fact, you're going to cuss people out and say you don't even know me. But I'm going to still use you because I, oh, God, thank you. I know, because you know that same night Peter said, Lord, you can depend on me. I ain't, you must be talking about one of them. Jesus said, in the same passage, before the cock crows at night, you're going to cuss people out saying you don't know me. But guess what? When the first century church starts, you're going to be my leader. Because I still want to use you knowing your brokenness. And you're going to appreciate me using you once you go through this. And watch this. When you go through that, you're going to strengthen somebody else because you went through it. You see? That's why you know God's for you. The situation is not what concerns him. It's I'm watching your faith. Because whatever you're supposed to learn in this is a part of your assignment. And we know that all things work together 
for the good of them that know, love God and those who are, are the called according to his purpose. It's his purpose. It's his purpose. When we gave our life to the Lord, it ain't ours anymore. Whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, however you want to do it, wherever you want to do it, why ever you want to do it, whatever ever I left out, your life, your sovereign. Let me pray. Father, I pray for somebody who's listening to this message or who has listened to it, that beyond the excitement of the message that they got the substance of it, that you are for us. <laughs> and that even hurtful victories are still victories. Thank you that you don't leave us the same and that through the crucible of suffering, you develop us into people and things that without the pain, we wouldn't be. So we join the Apostle Paul and say, yeah, I will rather glory in my infirmities <laughs> that the power of Christ might be manifest in me. For his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this service. Thank you for your eternal word. And may it light our paths forever, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Give it up for Pastor Battle one more time. Was anybody blessed by that dynamic word from the Lord? Hallelujah. That God will use you even in your brokenness. Father God, we thank you for that message. If there's anyone in the house today, I just want to extend this invitation to you that when God moves, in this kind of way where he's speaking and he's, he's giving us hope, he's giving us freedom, he's giving us deliverance, one of the best things we can do is trust him. Amen? Amen. One of the best things he can do is trust him. And so today I just want to give you guys an opportunity as the deacons and the ministers come up front. This is a great opportunity to trust him with your life. Amen? One of the best things that you can do is trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? So can, can we just open up the doors to the church? Amen? Hallelujah. If anyone is thinking about having a relationship with Christ, this is your opportunity. We want to welcome you. We want to be your church family. We want to put our arms around you. We want to tell you we love you. Amen? Amen. This is a great opportunity right here and right now. Come on, clap those hands.
so we celebrate him today. Amen. Lord, don't give, give, give a benediction as we leave out this place. Make sure you shake someone's hand and tell them that you love them. Also, Pastor Battle will be downstairs to meet and greet you. He has books that he's going to be signing. So make sure you stop down on the middle level. Father, we thank you for this dynamic word. We thank you how you, you spoke today, oh God. We thank you for the encouragement. Father God, we know that we are going through a process, but we are not going through by ourselves. Father God, we thank you for the tears that we've sown. We will reap in joy. We love you. We bless you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.